Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Loving Father, we are truly thankful for the blood of Jesus. Thank you so much, Father, that a fountain has been opened up for uncleanliness and sin, and that the vilest of sinners can find pardon and peace. Thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for this beautiful Sabbath day. Thank you truly, Lord, for a day which is a sign of your sanctifying and your creative power. And we know that redemption is not a modification, but an entire renovation, an entire recreation. Mm -hmm. And so the Sabbath is a sign to us that the work that you begun, you are fully able to complete. Mm -hmm. And so Father, we just surrender our hearts to you afresh this morning, thanking you so much for the work of grace that you have begun. And we are asking, Lord, that as we open up your word, that you'd please impress upon our hearts something which you have been revealing, something which is truly the burden of your heart. Please bless us now and abide with us, for I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Blessed Sabbath. Um, you know, to a short study, by God's grace. Um, what I want us to look at, we're going to be looking at something, as I said in my prayer, um, I truly believe that this is the burden of the heart of God for humanity, and I believe even especially for this final generation, that God is seeking to accomplish this. I wouldn't say not so much, it's more on our part. This is how God feels. But he is seeking to, yeah, we look at it. This is interesting, what God is desiring. This is, I'm saying everything else from Genesis to Revelation. From the beginning to the conclusion of the matter, this is God's purpose. He has one great purpose. I believe that the whole Bible is specifically established upon this purpose. Only one great purpose. One burden upon the heart of God. And you know, when we talk about victory over sin, friends, victory over sin, Do you know many people get confused? Their main goal in life is merely victory over sin. Now, don't get me wrong. That's something we should be striving for, victory over sin. But there's something I'm saying which is, is much higher than that. And I'm saying that victory over sin will be a byproduct if we enter into this thing, which the, God's heart is burdened. This is what God is craving for. Actually, we are told that he hungers for. It does for. This is what God wants. And I believe we're going to see in the Bible that the plan of redemption can only conclude based on the book, the Bible. The Bible is going to tell us very clearly that the plan of redemption or the cleansing of the sanctuary can only be accomplished when God gets this right. It's not so much that God gets it right, it's when we see it and we enter into it. Then the plan of redemption will conclude. Then Jesus will have a clean sanctuary. And we are not merely talking about victory over sin. Yes, we want victory over sin. But what we are speaking about is greater to, to the heart of God. And victory over sin is a byproduct of this one great thing. This one great thing. Now, friends, let me just say this whilst it's in my mind. Do you know how Patriarchs and Prophets start the conflict of the series? Does anybody know this? I'm drifting, I'm drifting. This is not my study. But because God is just putting it in my mind as I'm speaking. Do you know how Patriarchs and Prophets, in the, the conflict of the series, the Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and King, um, Desire of Ages, uh, Acts of the Apostles, Great Controversy. Do you know how Patriarchs and Prophets, the first sentence, it says, God is love. When you come to the final book in the, in the conflict of the series, which the prophet wrote, in a final book in the conflict of the series, because it's from Genesis to Revelation, those five books take you to. Do you know what's the last sentence in Great Controversy? The very last sentence of Great Controversy is, God is love. Patriarchs and prophets starts, the, the beginning starts, God is love. The conclusion of the matter, God is love. Now friends, I'm telling you what we're studying, Today, I believe you'll get a glimpse of the character of his love. Now, 
I want to begin with paper, uh, Great Controversy, page 488. We're going to try by God's grace, because we have to... Patriarchs and Prophets, page 488. Patriarchs and pro Oh, sorry, why did I say Patriarchs and Prophets? Great Controversy, page 488. Great Controversy, page 488. This is going to set our study. We are told the subject, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should clearly, be clearly understood by the people of God. I want to pause there. What subjects should be clearly and, and the investigative judgment? So you know, I'm saying, do you know there are people who get caught up, I'm saying just merely studying the sanctuary, and they go nowhere. We are told, even in early writings, page 63, whenever the prophet mentions the sanctuary, she always connects her to the investigative judgment. The sanctuary in and of itself, just looking at it, wonderful, but that's not the object of it. The great object is God to draw our mind to Christ's closing work in the sanctuary above, which is the investigative judgment. Now, why does God want us to understand investigative judgment? Now, listen to the quotation. She says, now, before I con continue with that, just so that we know, in early writing, she says, there are many precious truths containing the word of God, but it's present truth that the flock needs now. And then she explains what is present truth. She says, the sanctuary, not by itself, the sanctuary in connection with the 2,300 days. So I'm saying whenever you see the prophet talk about the sanctuary, it's always in connection with the investigative judgment, the 2,300 year prophecy. So it's not in and of itself, we should merely study the sanctuary. It's in connection with the investigative judgments. And friends, I'm really shocked that there are men, I am amazed, man of the man I'm seeing, well-known men who are rejecting the sanctuary. I'm saying, I'm not talking about people back then, Desmond, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about men who are once pillars standing for truth. Friend, I'm serious. I just saw, oh, friends, I was amazed. Men that were standing like a pillar for truth are now saying there's no sanctuary, there's no investigative judgments, that 457 BC never ever existed. There's no such of a day year principle. Now, I'm saying if it was some man who was off the streets or some apostate in Babylon, we can, don't, it wouldn't bother us. But when it's a man that once stood as a pillar in Adventism, Saying these things, it's startling. She says the shaking will come by the introduction of false theories. One of these things, she says, there will be a departure upon the subject of the sanctuary. That's Lost Events 177. We are literally seen it before our eyes. Now, GC 488. She says the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. So I'm asking you, what does the prophet say? You must clearly understand. The, now, the sanctuary, remember when she speaks of sanctuary, it's always in light with the investigative judgment. Investigative judgment takes place in the sanctuary above. So she's talking about the sanctuary in connection the judgment. Now, why should we understand this? Why should we understand this? She says the subject of the sanctuary and investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need an understanding for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible to exercise the faith essential for this time. Now, what should we glean from these things? What should we glean from these things? The position and his, his work. Now, his position, where's the position just means where he is, is in the most holy place. His work. Now, thank you. I knew we were going to say cleansing of the sanctuary. I'm going to say amen. And yes, no, no, cleansing of the sanctuary is perfect. That I would have said cleansing of the sanctuary. But I want us to study this and see we can replace cleansing of the sanctuary with a different word. Okay, judgment, powerful. But I'm saying, do you know that the cleansing of the sanctuary would never, yeah, what I'm saying, I can put capital never, be cleansed 
until God accomplishes what we're about to study. I'm saying you, your sins will never be cleansed. You would never gain victory over sin if what we're about to study you never enter into. I'm saying everything else falls secondary to this. You say, why? Because the whole tenor of the Bible is for this one great purpose. That, true. Now I'm saying, do you know that even the cleansing of sin, I'm saying that is not, that is not actually the highest of the highest things. God does want sin cleansed. He does want, he does want sin cleansed. But I'm saying there's a motive higher than that that's driving God to try and get a cleansed people. I'm saying a motive far greater than just having a cleansed people. There's a motive driving him. There's something, friends, do you know, when something's driving you, you can go very far. When you have a motive that is driving you, you can even lay down your life for that thing. And I'm saying this, it is love. That is true. It is love. But there's a specific word. I'm saying, yes, it is love. True, it's love. But I'm saying the whole purpose of the Bible is to develop this one great thing. Friends, I'm telling you, this is the heart of God, what we're about to study. What we're about to study, even angels cannot enter into what we're about to study. I'm, not, I'm gonna show you clearly, angels cannot enter into this. Only one race of God's creation can enter into that, and it's the human race. None other. In some degree, they can, but not as the human family can. The human family is unique to all his creation. Someone says, what is he talking about? Now, the sanctuary and the judgment, she says we should clearly understand. Now, what is the purpose of us studying or understanding this? We must understand his position. Where is he? Where is he? So position, I would just put P. Position, most holy. And work, cleansing, but that's not the work, what we're studying. The work that we're gonna to study today is only a byproduct of the genuine work, the genuine desire, the genuine burden upon the heart of God. God has a burden, he has a desire on his heart. And I'm telling you friends, the final generation, I, I don't guess, God has made it crystal clear that the final generation is gonna enter into this experience we're about to study. They're going to enter into it. And I'm saying because it's such a burden on the heart of God, it's something that God craves so much that God says, you can't die. I'm enjoying this. Communion, Communion powerful, but that's not it. <laughs> Come and read your Bible to Revelations. 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 Now, as you're going to Revelation chapter 10, I want to say this. One more quotation in the book Evangelism, page triple two. We are told that the people of God should be more earnest students of prophecy and they should not rest until they become intelligent in regard to the subject of the sanctuary. Question, now what does the prophet link to the sanctuary? I'm asking based on this quote. Now, uh, previous quotations, early 1963, Great Controversy 488, she links the sanctuary to the investigative judgments. But in this quotation, what does she link the sanctuary with? Prophecy. So uh, does prophecy, based on the prophet, is prophecy, does prophecy help us understand something concerning the work above? You say, what do you mean? How can prophecy help me understand? Question, can anybody's eyes penetrate into heaven? No. Your, your eyes cannot penetrate. Do you know what prophecy does? Prophecy reveals to us where <coughs> Jesus is in his ministry. Did you hear what I said? Prophecy reveals to us where Jesus is in his ministry. Friends, let me say this. Do you know that even if you would just study the sanctuary by itself, without, I'm saying, going anywhere else, you would realize that the Sunday law, when it comes, it is too late for God's people to prepare. If you just study the sanctuary itself, it is too late. Based on the sanctuary, friends, Sunday law comes only after God has a sinless congregation. 
Do you know the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 that all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Who suffers persecution? Those that are godly. Question, if you are not godly, can you receive persecution? No, those who are persecuted are those that love godly in Christ Jesus. Godly means righteousness, holiness. Jesus says, blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake. Persecution only comes after God has a sinless congregation, at least amongst his people, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Then they will give the loud cry to those outside. Great controversy for the eight is crystal clear. When there's a genuine revival amongst God's people, she says, then persecution comes. Persecution is a byproduct of God's people gaining victory. But yet again, I say that victory is only a byproduct. We're going to prove, we're going to read the quotation. The prophet's going to be crystal clear that persecution comes when God's people enter into this experience. Now, Revelation chapter 10. Revelations 10. Revelations 10. Now, I wonder where Jesus is in the sanctuary. I wonder where he is. Do you know, friends, do you know that where Jesus is, he can go no further? You say, what do you mean? Jesus has come to the furthest place in the sanctuary, the most holy place. Friends, if I walk up to the wall, I can go no further. The only next thing for me to do is to turn around and walk out. Do you know that Jesus is about to leave the sanctuary? Someone says, how do you know? Friends, the Sunday law is a byproduct of God's people entering into this, this, this I almost gave it away, <laughs> entering into this experience which gives birth to victory over sin. And when victory is seen and achieved amongst God's church, now not all, not all are going to gain victory. Not that God is, doesn't have the power. Not that he doesn't have the power. God has abundance of power. It's just that men would choose darkness rather than light. They will choose to live in their sin rather than deny themselves. Friends, let me say this. As Christians, we are swimming against the stream. We are swimming against the tide. And some people can swim for a little while and they become weary. The Bible gives us the remedy for weariness. That the eyes must be fixed upon the man of Calvary. That's the only thing that can keep us going on. The Apostle Paul, we are telling patriarchs and prophets, there were times, she says, when his own, his own world conflicted with the will of God. But she says, one glance, one glance at the man. And she says he would pick up anew his cross, pick up anew. Now, I'm going to suggest that Jesus is almost done in the sanctuary above. Almost. Friends, this is the final generation. This is it. How do I know? I want you to see this. It says, maybe I'll come back to that. Come back to this. Come back to this. I want us to look at this. April 17, 2023. Now, I don't think I've covered this with us before. It says Supreme Court, April 17, 2023, a couple of days ago. It says Supreme Court considers Christian mail carriers' refusal to work on what day? Sunday. Now, question, where did it reach? That this, by the way, do you, know that no, do you know that whenever there's an issue, it doesn't go to the Supreme Court? It goes from court, lower court, another court, until if they see fit, it reaches the highest court in America, and it's the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court not long ago overturned Roe versus Wade. Did we not show that? Question, how was Roe versus Wade, what did they say influenced that decision? Roe versus Wade being overthrown. Roe versus Wade has to do with abortion. What did the people in America say influenced Roe versus Wade being overthrown? The church influencing the state to overthrow it. And who done it? Which court done it? Which court done it? Supreme Court. Now, after that, on the, on the heels of that, this man says, I'm not working Sunday. It's the Lord's day. Where was it directed to? The Supreme Court. I wonder, how was the Supreme Court, 
How do they consider this man's decision? Watch it. It says, Supreme Court seems, what's that next word? Sympathetic. What does sympathetic mean? In his favor. It says, Supreme Court seems sympathetic, sympathetic to postal worker who didn't work Sundays in dispute over religious accommodations. De definitely. So you can see that Sunday, this issue of Sunday, has already it's been driven to the Supreme Court, the highest court in America, to consider protecting Sunday, at least in this man's case first. Another one, watch it. Supreme Court showdown over Sabbath, watch it, could change workplace, not just for this man, across United States. Friends, friends, what more do we want to see for us to wake up and realize that we are coming to the conclusion of the Day of Atonement? That this is it, beloved. I'm saying we can no longer play around. Friends, it is too late in the day to be playing with sin. If it means I'm not going to bed, don't go to bed. If it means I'm not eating for a week, I'm fasting. Eat, don't eat for a week and fast. Your, your eternal life is of more value to you, should be to you, than even this mortal life on this earth. Friends, this is it. I'm not guessing. I'm not even suggesting. I'm telling you that this is it. Watch it. I need to, after this, I'm going to pause and pray. We have to stop. And then I want you to listen. Listen to something that is, that is taking America. This is fresh. This, this, this news clip, fresh. This is a movement that's taking America by storm. I want you to listen. This week, we look at the rise of theocracy in the United States. The rise of what? Now, please help me. Help me. A theocracy is a nation or a government that is governed or controlled by who? God. Now, who do you think would be the people taking the place of God for the government and saying, we, we will do God's job and help you? The church. This week, we look at the rise of theocracy in the United States. It includes the growing belief by some on the far right that there is not and never has been an actual wall of separation separating between church and state. We focus on Moscow, Idaho. It's a small college town near the border with Washington State where a pastor named Doug Wilson of Christ Church is embracing a form of Christian nationalism. Pastor Wilson told NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson that he's fighting secularism in what he calls a cold civil war. So in your version of a Christian town, would there be a place for non-believers? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Would, would yeah. there be a place for same-sex couples? But well, you mean legally? Yes. You, you mean like uh, marriage? Mm -hmm. uh, no, no marriage. But there'd be uh, same-sex couples. No marriage, even though it's the law of the land in the United States? Uh, just like Roe used to be, right? Did you hear what he said? <laughs> just as Roe used to be. So I'm saying these Christians are looking at if we could have influenced the Supreme Court, the government, to overthrow Roe versus Wade, then we can influence them to overthrow into other things as well. This is their mindset. But this way we look. Now listen. The panel. Now, yes. Yes, a whole lot of, he's going to show at least three. There's much more. But now they're going to show at least three um, Republicans. And I want you to hear what these Republicans say. The panel back. Now, let me, let me stop there. Let someone say, okay, let us vote because next year's voting. So someone says they're going to vote for Democrats. Don't be a fool. Because we know there are some people. Now, let me say this. So next year's also voting for South Africa. You'll know that, right? Next year's voting. Now, let me say this. If you are Seventh-day Adventist, you have no right going to a voting poll and voting. You have, friends, we do a study and show you you will be guilty of the sins committed by those men that you have voted for. There's a clear quotation that says that. Now, some people think that the solution, if I can vote Trump, or if I can vote for Biden, or if I can vote for EFP, or IFP, what's that, IFFP, or EFF, yes, 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 EFF, or if I can vote for Ramaphosa, oh, some of the problems can be solved. Friends, don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. You know, if, let me say this, 
if the solutions of the world could be found in politics, Jesus would have come as a politician. If the solutions of the world could be f solved as being an economist, Jesus would have come as an economist. If the solutions of the world could be found, uh, solved as a, as, as a, a science, Jesus would have come as a scientist. Friends, the Bible tells us how Jesus came. Let, let me drift. Come, I'm just drifting. Come with me to John 3. John, John 3. I need to pause and pray and conclude. John 3. Come with me to John 3. Please tell me, the master, how did the master come to the earth? Because therein lies the solution. John chapter 3, verse 2. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher sent from God. Pause. How did Jesus come into the world as a what? Then question, where is the solutions of the world found in teaching? In teaching. Not in politics. Not in economy. Not in science. The solutions of the world is found in teaching. Why? Because the master of this universe decided to come into this world as a teacher. And therefore, I can safely follow in his steps. Now, back to our point. Let's go back. Back to Revelation 10. I need to pray. Now, I want you to listen. The panel back. Peter, this is not sort of disaggregated from the world of Trump. In many ways, it's fused with Trumpism. In fact, let me put a mash together of, of some candidates that Trump has endorsed mm -hmm. who are all sort of preaching this, there's no wall yeah. uh, between church and state. Take a look. And I'm tired of this separation of church and state junk. In November, we're going to take our state back. My God will make it so. We need to be the party of nationalism. And I'm a Christian and I say it proudly. We should be Christian nationalists. Now, Donald Trump has embraced this. Evangelicals embraced Trump. It was sort of a grand bargain, right? They seem to get what they want, and it is fused into something else. Now, let's yeah. stop it there. Now, question. Did you, hear the, did you hear the Republicans speaking? I am tired of this church and state junk. Question. Who was one of the, what, 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 who was one of the greatest opposers to Kevin McCarthy becoming House Speaker? The very same lady. Lauren Bopart or something like that. But yes, and she said that in order for Kevin McCarthy to become House Speaker, he had to make concessions. What are one of those concessions? Moving the state closer to the church. Friends, this is the image has been formed in our eyes. This, we are told in 7 BC 976, that's going to determine our eternal destiny. We are here. Now, I'm going to pause and pray. This year was, where's the date? 21st of April. Friends, these all what we are showing you is within a couple of days. What, this is crosswalks.com. What is the Sabbath and is it still important today? Now, friends, don't be confused when they're saying, what, what is the Sabbath? Is the, don't think they're talking about the seventh day. They're talking about the false Sabbath. It says, something tells me that the glorious almighty God didn't need to rest. But he knew that we would. So he sets a pattern from the beginning of creation. Six days of work followed by a day of rest. He blessed this day and made it holy. Later in Exodus 20 verse 8 to 11, he made this a pattern. Into, he made this pattern into a command. Now watch it. Which day they're talking about? It says most Bible scholars agree that today God also desires to give his children the same gift of rest. And Christians all around the world now observe the first day of the week, Sunday, as a day honored of God. Friends, you can see it very clear. I'm saying we're going to have to be blind not to see there's a gathering storm. I can see it. I can see it. Now, I want to pause and pray. The honor pose and prayer. Coming back, coming back, coming back. Something. Excellent. Oh, I'm coming. Oh, oh, friends. Do you know? Please remind me to play this clip. Do you know that the World Economic Forum has a diet for you? There's a, we're going to play. I just hope I've got time. They have a diet for you. I want, we're going to see what's their diet for you. But I want to pose and pray on this one. You know who's this man? Carlson Tucker. It says... Do you know he's fired from Fox News? We shared with you a couple of days back. We shared with you. He was fired a couple of days back. One of the most viewed 
news reporter in, on, 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 on that side of the um, on cable TV, one of the most viewed, millions would view, night after night after night, because he would speak on subjects which no one wants to speak about. Do you know who was behind one, getting, wanting this man out of Fox? Besides others which we shared, is the Pentagon. Now why would the Pentagon want him out? Exposing and shows you What's coming for us? Pentagon officials quietly cheering Tucker Carlson's departure from Fox News. Again, good riddance. Pentagon officials reportedly pleased about Tucker Carlson Fox News splits. Friends, I stop here and pray. Short study. Now friends, one more thing. If you're not going to believe Bible and spiritual prophecy that we are living in a lost day, some people won't listen to Bible and spiritual prophecy. They like Elon Musk, someone of that nature to tell them. So for your sake, for those of you who are not going to just listen to Bible and spiritual prophecy, we will make the man tell you himself. This is Elon Musk. Elon Musk predicts the end of mankind says an apocalypse is close. Again, Elon Musk sends dire end of the world warning. Civilization is going to crumble. These are the stones speaking. Stones are telling you that things cannot continue. And what these stones are saying is in the Bible. Let us live in Neil for a short prayer and get into our quick study. Yes, Neil. Loving Father, we humbly approach your righteous and holy throne. We do so in much humility of heart, realizing that you are a holy God. And Father, we are told in inspiration that even the angels, when they approach you, that they have such reverence that they veil themselves. We are told in the book of education that even when they mention your name, they veil their faces. That's how holy you are. And so, Father, we, we really approach your throne with reverence, realizing that our hearts are undone. And that without the righteousness of Jesus, we could never enter into your presence. But we are truly thankful for that wonderful gift that has made a bridge between heaven and earth, that has united man and God. And so, Father, we come before you on the merits of our Savior. And we are pleading, Lord, that as we look briefly into this which is the burden of your heart, the burden of even having a clean sanctuary that can never be cleansed until you can accomplish this within our lives. And so, Father, please bless us now as we study. Please, may your spirit guide and teach us. May you draw us closer to you. And may you please help us, Lord, by your grace to enter into such an experience. We love you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come with me to Revelation chapter 10. Very quickly, friends. Revelation 10. Revelation 10. We're going to move fast. Revelation 10. Um, now, Revelation chapter 10. I'm not studying this, but there's one part I want to read. Now, does anybody know when did the seventh angel sound his trumpet. I think we have studied this. We have studied this. When did the seven angels sound his trumpet? There are seven trumpets. But the seven angels sounded his trumpet is found in Revelation 11. Verse 15 onwards to verse 19. What is it, brother? You said something? Thank you so much. So, the brother mentioned something. That Christ, the, sorry, the seventh angel or the seventh trumpet began sounding in 1844. Now we're not proving that, that's Bible. You can see that when he sounds, it says the ark of the, um, the temple was opened and the ark of his covenant was seen. Now in great controversy, Ellen White makes it crystal clear that this part being opened specifically 
the most holy place in 1844. You'll actually see a commentary on that verse. But nonetheless, in 1844, the seventh angel sounded. Now friends, I want you to see biblically, biblically, what did God desire or still desires should be finished, should have been finished sometime after the sounding. We are still in the sounding of the seventh angel. We are still in it. When will the angel stop sounding? When this is accomplished. What's accomplished? We're about to read it. Because when, when this is accomplished, the angel ceases to sound, Jesus can come back. Final events rapidly are fulfilled. Revelation chapter 10. Tell me, Revelation 10, what does the Bible say? Revelation 10 verse 7. It says, but in the days of his voice, sorry, verse 7. Father, please bless your words in Jesus' name. Amen. It says in verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when it shall begin to sound, watch it, the mystery of God should be finished. As he declared to his servants, the prophet, stop, 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 and think with me now. Question, what is God seeking now after 1844? Actually, God wanted us always. But what is he seeking for the mystery? Question, what, what, what does it say? That after the angel sound, what should be finished? The mystery of God. Finished. Someone says, what is this mystery? Friends, I truly believe that when the mystery is finished, when the mystery is finished, Jesus will throw down his censer. He will say to his father, it is done. He would leave the sanctuary when this is finished. All the 144,000, all those who give the loud cry, all the sealed, will have this mystery accomplished within their lives. You say, what is the mystery? Friends, let's study the mystery. I want us to look at the mystery. Come with me to Ephesians 1, actually Ephesians 3. Do you know how many times I read this verse I'm about to read with you? And only in this week I saw it. I've literally, I've read this verse over 50 times. Maybe even over 100. Ephesians 3. Before I share the verse, <laughs> I want to take us back. Okay, I'm going to back, I'm going to back, I'm going to back. This is, look. Now, I want to ask a question. I'm going to suggest, I'm not asking a question, I'm going to suggest that whatever this mystery is, whatever it is, it's not anything new. It's something which God even created us for. It's his great purpose in creating man was for this mystery. The Bible calls it a mystery. I'm actually proof. The Bible calls this a mystery. And Paul doesn't call it a mystery once. In Ephesians, the book of Ephesians specifically dwells on this mystery. He speaks of it in Ephesians 3. He speaks of it in Ephesians 5. And he speaks of, actually, he uses the literal so that we can understand the spiritual. Now, what is this mystery? Um, let me tell you before I read a quotation, before I read a verse, let me tell you what's the mystery. I'm going to say there are few men that walk this earth that have entered into this experience. Few men, holy men, few of them. And let me say this, the one man's experience, I'm saying because this is the burden of the heart of God, because this is something that he craves for, he hungers for, he thirsts for. So much so that when a man enters into this experience with him, in a real sense, that God would not allow that man to taste it. I'm telling you, there was literally a man who walked this planet that entered into this experience with God, that it was so sweet to God, it, such, it so satisfied the heart of God that God says, you cannot rest in the grave. I want to continue this with you throughout eternity because this thing is so good to me. <laughs> Enoch. <laughs> but what experience? What experience? Walked with God. 
Now, if you are here during the day of fasting and praying in the week, then you would know. I kept speaking on that. I kept, I, I was throwing it in everywhere I could. <laughs> Fellowship. Fellowship. This is the pattern of God's word, fellowship. Not a fellowship as a child and a father. That is good, and it's good we see God as our father. That's good. But the fellowship we are talking about, friends, I'm telling you, a father and a child, good fellowship. But it cannot fully satisfy because there's two different levels. That's a child. But the fellowship we are talking about is a king with a king. To him that overcomes, will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I have overcome and sat down with my father on his throne. We are talking about a fellowship between two kings. This is the fellowship God's heart's burden, his heart's craving for. This is the tenor of the Bible. This is the purpose of creation. This is the purpose of victory over sin, fellowship. Fellowship. Now, I want you to see, let's see what's the mystery. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3 verse 9. It says in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 9, And to make all men see, what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world had been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Friends, the Bible calls it a, the mystery of fellowship. How God and man can enter into fellowship, not so much as a son and a father, but between two kings. This is the destiny set before us. This is our destiny. Now, I want you to see something. I want you to see, because all we know is mystery of fellowship, but what is this fellowship? What, what does it look like? What, how, how, what? Let's see, let's keep reading. Now, I want you to see, it's not gonna tell us everything in this, in this chapter, but I want you to see something. Verse 11, it says, talking about this fellowship, actually verse 10, to the intent that now, unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Another time, this is a powerful verse we look at, but look at verse 11. I want you to see verse 11. It says, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to stop right there. Please help me now, I'm asking for your help. What was he speaking about in verse nine, which was a mystery which has been hid? hid. For, it was the mystery of fellowship. Now in verse nine, he says the eternal purpose. Is he talking about the same thing? Yes, it's the same thing. Because this thing has been hidden from way back, the mystery of fellowship. Now friends, as I'm saying, someone says, but the angels, isn't not God having fellowship with angels? Friends, what I am talking about is something greater than a fellowship with angels. Much greater. Far exceeds that. God has fellowship with angels, but what we are studying is not what God has with angels. It's not what God has with other created beings, no. We are studying something which far, do you know why God created man? Friends, I'm serious. God created man to enter into fellowship with us. Fellowship, he could not enter in with angels or any other creation. Inspiration says man was a new and a distinct order of beings. Different. Someone says, brother, this sounds too good to be true. It sounds like you're going too extreme. I'm gonna to get to the quotations. We're gonna to get to the quotations. Now, tell me what does he call this fellowship? What does he call it, the eternal what? It, yes, it's the mystery, but look at verse nine. The eternal what? Eternal purpose. Eternal purpose. Now, I want us to look at this purpose. Eternal purpose. Come with me to Ephesians 1. Actually, you know what? I'll come back to Ephesians 1. Come with me to Ephesians 5. I'll come back to Ephesians 1. Come with me to Ephesians 5. Okay. Ephesians 5. It says, we are talking about fellowship. We are talking about the mystery of fellowship, the eternal purpose. Ephesians 5, verse 30, 31. For we are members of his body, 
of his flesh and of his bones. Look at verse 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, watch it, and they too shall be what? Now please help me. So Paul is talking about a fellowship between husband and wife becoming one. Now friends, if you stop there, you think that that's what Paul's speaking about. Paul's not speaking about that. Look at the next verse. He says, this is that great what? Mystery of fellowship. This is the great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The mystery of fellowship is how that God and man can become one. This is the great burden on the hearts of God, wanting to become one with his creation. Someone says, but not the angels. Whoa, we're going to show you angels cannot experience this. Cannot. They can know fellowship, but not what we are studying. Bible says that angels desire to look into what we are studying. They stand astonished and amazed what God is seeking to accomplish in the human life. Now, come with me to Ephesians 1 quickly. Now, before Ephesians 1, I want you to see this. Education 124. Now, what I'm saying when you're talking about the mystery being finished, I'm not talking about something new. I'm saying that this was the purpose of God creating mankind. It's for the purpose of fellowship. Look at this quotation. Education 124. She says, man created for fellowship Please help me. What was man created for? For fellowship with God. The great purpose of God creating man, friends, you'll hear many things and it's wonderful. I'm saying based on inspiration, man was created not to be a servant, a slave, but for fellowship. Jesus said to his disciples that a servant does not know what his masters do. Yet yeah, before I call you servants, but now he says you are my friends. God is seeking for friendship, fellowship. Listen to this. Man created for fellowship with God can only in such fellowship find his real life and development. So question, what is your purpose of your creation? I'm asking you, why, were you, why did God create Tesla, Sharif? What, 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 did he create you, what did he create me for? Fellowship. Fellowship. Someone says, why was I created? And inspiration says, you are created for fellowship. Now friends, believe it or not, let me ask you something. If somebody is on your mind 24-7, think now, you're a young person, you wake up, from the time you wake up, you dream about this person. To the time you sleep, you dream about them. Whole day you are thinking about them. What will you say is wrong? What, what will you say this person has? What does this person have? An obsession. An obsession. I say it very reverently. God has an obsession for the human family. I'm going to prove it publicly. God has an obsession, not only for the, he has an obsession for you, personally, for you. And to you, there's none other that, when he looks at you, I'm going to show you the quotations, friends. He sees no one else but you. Now, it says man created for fellowship with God can only in such fellowship find his real life and development. Created to find in God his highest joy. He can find in nothing else that which can quiet the cravings of the heart and can satisfy the hunger and thirst of the soul. That is interesting. It's just flashing to my mind now. Now, I want you to, this is powerful. Now, that last part, we need to move quickly now. Now, I want you to think, there's so many things that ran through my mind. Mm, mm, help me, Lord. Mm. Question, okay, there's two points. Question, God is just flashing things. Created to find in God his highest joy, he can find in nothing else that which can quiet the cravings of, his heart, of the heart. Question, if there's a craving in your heart and you achieve that thing, whatever craving it is, do you know you're still going to be void? Because only, that's what you just said now, that the only thing that can satisfy the craving is to love for the purpose on which you are created. Not as a servant and a slave, but for fellowship. 
fellowship. Friends, I'm, you know there's some sweet quotations. I wish we can get there. I'm telling you, friends, do you know if we can get some of these quotations and just rivet it in our mind, you will never murmur again in your life. Even if you lose a hand or arm, you will not even murmur. You will thank God. Someone says, ah, is that ah, just so we can get there? There are some quotations, if we can get these quotations, you will never murmur in your life again. Never. Now, second point. Can satisfy the hunger and thirst of the soul come question? Who is it talking about? Whose hunger and thirst is going to satisfy? Us. Now, I want you to think with me now. Just think with me. Isaiah 58, I'm just speaking now. Isaiah 58, verse 6 and 7 says, Is this the fast that I have chosen? Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To lose the pans of wickedness, to undo every burden, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. Is it not to deal thy bread, verse 7, to the hungry? Now think, stop, 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 and think. You know what? Let me tell you. 99% of us, when we read that, you know what we think of? The poor, the needy, and the suffering. Everyone would say, poor, needy, suffering. But hang on. This text, it says, satisfy. Listen carefully. But Isaiah 50, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? Someone says, whoa, if it's not the poor, the needy, who is it referring to? Friends, think. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice, I will come in and do what? And sup with him. Eat with him. Now someone says, oh, Jesus talking about food. Friends, think in John chapter 4. Jesus was literally hungry in John 4. His disciples went to buy bread. But he, he was having a conversation with a woman whom his soul was hungering for her salvation. And when she embraced it and she opened up her heart and allowed him in and she went with joy to tell everyone what a friend she has found in Jesus. As the disciples came back and they said, Lord, eat. He says, I have bread to eat which you, have, you know nothing of. Me to eat which you know nothing of. Friends, Jesus is hungering and thirsting. As much as the human soul hungers and thirsts, Jesus is hungering and thirsting. There's no one that can fill your place in his heart. No matter how many people are saved, there's no one that can fill your place in his heart. There will be an eternal void in his heart should we be lost. Now, now I want us to move on. Come with me to Ephesians. Where did I say? Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I want us to look at Ephesians 1. We want to wrap up quickly. Um, Ephesians chapter 1. Oh, in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, I want to read Ephesians 1. Now remember that the mystery of the fellowship is what the, the eternal purpose of God, right? It's the eternal purpose of God. Now I want you to see uh, how does it look like? What does it look like? What does it accomplish when this fellowship is truly seen? What does it accomplish? I want us to see verse 9. Ephesians 1 verse 9. It says, Having made known unto us the mystery of of his will. So we are back to this mystery of fellowship. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he had, what's that word there? Purpose. So this mystery which he has purposed in himself. Now let's see verse 10. How does it look like? What is, the, what is he trying to accomplish? Verse 10. It says, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth, even in him. Now stop and think. This fellowship is gathering all in one. In other words, what the Bible is saying to us, that the outcome of the fellowship is that God's creation will become completely one with Christ. That's the fellowship. Now, I want you to see something interesting. Look at this. This way. I want you to see this. This is from the book Desire, Ages 21. Listen to what she says. She says, the angels of glory find their joy in giving, giving love, tireless watch care, to souls that are fallen and unholy. This is what the angels do. Heavenly beings who the hearts of men, they bring to the dark world light from the courts above. By gentle and patient ministry, they move upon the human spirit. Now watch what they do. 
They move upon the human spirit to bring the lost, what is the next word? Into fellowship with Christ, which is even closer than they themselves can know. Are you seeing what angels do? They are working to bring us into a fellowship with Christ. Closer than they themselves can even know. Because God created us to enter into a fellowship that no created being could ever do. This is his prized creation as mankind. It's you. Sorry? They find joy. They're not, they're not complaining. I'm bringing them into a closer fellowship. They're not complaining. They find joy. Unselfish ministry. Unselfish ministry. They're not saying, oh, I'm going to be, they're going to be better. Mm -mm. Unselfish ministry. Come into Corinthians 1. I want you to see that this is the purpose of the gospel. This is the whole purpose of everything. Even the cleansing of the sanctuary. Sin will be done away with when man can enter into fellowship with God. Corinthians 1, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. The Bible says, God is faithful by whom he were called. What's the purpose of your calling? Unto fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why has God called you out of the world, out of sin, out of he wants fellowship. God's heart is craving for fellowship. Fellowship, friendship. Friends, do you know, you know, let me say this. Do you know that everyone who was lost, everyone who receives the mark of the beast, I don't care where, what, I, who they are, everyone who receives the mark of the beast simply has not entered into fellowship, friendship with God. Come with me to John 16. John chapter 16. John 16. I want you to see John chapter 16. John 16. John chapter 16. I want us to see John the 16th chapter, verse 2. John 16, verse 2. Now, friends, we are told in testimonies to ministers, page 117 that God has called his people to expose the wickedness of the man of sin. This is our duty, to expose that man. Do you know, hmm, as much as God is calling us into fellowship, do you know that Satan is also calling the human family into fellowship? Bible says very clearly that Satan is seeking fellowship with the human family. That's what he wants. God wants it, Satan wants it. They both want fellowship. You know what God says? Keep your finger here quickly. Let me just show you. Come with me to 1 Corinthians. We want to just read these few verses, show some things and then pray. Come with me to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Are we there? Verse 20. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20. It says, But I say, these things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that he should have fellowship with devils. Question, are the devils seeking fellowship with mankind? Is God seeking fellowship? Yes. Yes. Counterfeit. Everything is a counterfeit. Everything, brother. John chapter 16. Friends, I'm saying the burden of the heart of God, friends, is fellowship and friendship. This is what God is craving for, is friendship. Remember that the prodigal son that went away? Remember in, in Luke um, chapter 18, I believe it is. Was it Luke 14? When that prodigal son went away, and he, and he came to his senses. And he says, I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to tell him. Now, he's not a child. He's obviously he's grown. And he says, I'm going to tell him that, Father, I have sinned against you and against God. And Father, I am no more worthy 
to be called a son. Make me one of your hired servants. Do you know when the parable continues and he comes back, do you know that his father does not, uh, don't eat the parable, con make sure that he doesn't even utter that words. Make me one of your hired servants. You know, when we think of the relationship, some people think God wants me to be a servant. No. God is seeking fellowship. Fellowship. Friends, Enoch, the Bible says that he walked with God and he was not. Why did God not allow Genesis 5.24? Why did he not allow Enoch to die? Why did Enoch not die? Because Enoch entered into a fellowship that was too good for God. Do you know that why the 144,000 died? Someone says, oh, God just closes probation and now they can't just be killed. Friends, mm -mm. Enoch did not die because he entered into a fellowship that was so unique to God that God says, Enoch, I want this thing to continue. The 144,000, they are entering into the mystery of fellowship that God's gonna say, this thing is too good for me, that you cannot die. A fellowship that's gonna satisfy the longing on the heart of God. Friends, in Desire Vages 191, she says, Christ thirsts for recognition. He hungers for the sympathy and love. He hungers for sympathy and love of those from those whom he has purchased with his own blood. Friends, this is what God's craving is, fellowship. And why did Enoch, why was he translated? Hebrews 11.5 says that before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He was a friend to God. Friendship. Friends, you know when someone's your friend, you keep talking to them. Constantly, you, when someone's your close friend, I'm saying the secrets of your life even share with that friend. God is seeking, is seeking for fellowship, friendship. And you know, question, do you know that when we share our secrets, not that God don't know them, but when we share it, then God shares his secrets to us. The secrets of, all, the, secrets of the Lord with them that fear him. This is a friendship he's seeking. Now, what does she say? Mm, God is good. What is Enoch? Enoch was a friend of God. That's how he walked with God. People cannot walk together unless they're friends. Enoch was a friend, friend to God. Now, John 16, John 16, verse two. It says, they shall put you, this is persecution. They shall put you out of the synagogue. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Now, why are they persecuting you? Why does Jesus say they're doing these things? Verse 3. These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. What don't these people have? Have no knowledge of God. They don't know God. Or they might have a, 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 a knowledge, but their knowledge is not a fellowship. Many will come to him that day and say, Lord, Lord, we've done all these things. He says, depart from me. Depart from me. Now, tell me the first sentence when will we be persecuted? Let me ask you this. When does persecution come to God's church? Revelation 13, 15, when the image is formed, Sunday law. Tell me now, what does she say will bring about the Sunday law or persecution? When does persecution come to us? Yes, the Sunday law, that is true. But the Sunday law is now physical, we've seen it. But it's the result of something. Look what is the result of. But it is fellowship with God that brings them the world's enmity. I'm saying we will only receive persecution when we enter into fellowship. Then persecution breaks upon the church because people have entered into fellowship with God. Now friends, there's much, 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 much more. But now, I wanna say this, you are not gonna enter into this fellowship, never will it be entered into. You, it's never gonna be entered into until you make this thing personal. You make God and Jesus, the work of redemption, personal. 
Friends, you know there are people who would say, uh, God loved the world, gave his only begotten son. God loved the world. And they exempt themselves. All these promises of God, all the death of Jesus, all of that was for them. Friends, that's not fellowship. You can't enter into fellowship like that. If you believe that all that outpouring of love was for others and not for you, then you cannot enter into this fellowship. I shared with you in this week, true, God so loved the world, true. But in Galatians 2, Paul says, God loved me. Christ loved me and gave himself for me. What is Paul doing? He is taking that, but he's making it personal. God loved me. Friends, when you look at Calvary, yes, Jesus is dying for the sins of the world. When you look at Calvary, you see Jesus dying for you. Because even if the world would have rejected Jesus, he would have to still die that death, but if it was only you, he would have still went through all that suffering, knowing in his mind, only you accepted him. He would have to still suffer that death that severe death just for us. We must make this thing personal in order for us to enter into fellowship. Must be made personal. Now, let me share with you something which I find very interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, by the way, the, the mystery of this fellowship, when you look at it clearly, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Christ and man, Christ and man becoming one. Friends, this is the fellowship that he's seeking, which is righteousness by faith. Now, let me say this. There's so much to say, but I'm not going to show that even justification cannot take place without fellowship. Cannot be done. Even forgiveness of sin cannot take place without fellowship. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 tells us very clearly, in order for your sins to be forgiven, you first need to have fellowship. That's what the Bible says. There is no forgiveness of sins until you enter into fellowship. 1 John 1 verse 7. Now I want to show you something interesting. Now listen to what she says, Christ's object, listen just on that point. She says it must be personal. It is fellowship with Christ's personal contact. So she says that it must be made personal if you're going to enter into this fellowship. I'll come back to this if time permits. Now, I want you to see something interesting. Come in your Bible to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Are we all there? Now, friends, I ask the question. If someone is constantly from morning to night thinking on this one person 24 7, no break, just on this one person, you say that's an obsession. I want you to see what does the Bible say. Before I read this powerful verse, I want you first to see this. Before I read that. This is from Ministry of Healing 488. Please tell me, how much are you in the thoughts of God? I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about you as an individual. You, how much are you in God's thoughts? Now someone says, how can, it, how can one person be in his thoughts and then another person and seven billion? Friends, let me show you why, before I show you anything. Before, I, I want to read this quotation in Steps to Christ. I hope I put it here. Steps to Christ. Listen to this. Before I show you, listen to this. Steps to Christ, page 100. She says, the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul upon the earth, this very earth, to share his watch care. So, friends, this is powerful. When God looks upon you, he sees no one else upon this earth but you. She says, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. So friends, when you read God so loved the world, say God so loved, I can put God so loved me. 
that he gave his beloved, he gave his only begotten son for me. But this is what the quotation is saying. God only sees you in this world as an individual and no one else. Now, where's my quotation? There's it. Friends, please, marvel. To let this sink down deep into your mind and heart. This is a precious thought. She says, then talk of the promises, talk of Jesus' willingness to bless. And look at the blue words. He does not forget us for one brief moment. Friends, this is sweet. He does not forget us for one brief moment. Be honest, sometimes you forget. You're so busy in your toss that you forget God. You forget him. But she says, yeah, he does not forget us for one brief moment. Even when you are sleeping, he's thinking on you. There's not a time God, friends, do you understand how much love God, God has for us? Not for a brief moment. One of my quotations that I, yeah, which is also sweet, like this one. Many years ago, I put it to memory in Selected Messages, book 338. She says, never. What does never mean? It means never. Never are we absent from the mind of God. Never, she says, am I personally, you personally, never are you personally absent from his mind. Never. Now, I want you to see this. See, the psalmist understood this. David understood this. Psalms 139. Tell me God's thoughts for you. Now, please, friends, or we are reading inspiration. This is God's words to us. And I want you to see God's thoughts to you. Now, friends, the wicked are going to be like the sand of the sea, right? They're just multitudes. Now, watch this. I want you to see the 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me. O oh God, how great is the sum of them. If I should count them, if I should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. Friends, God's thoughts towards you are more than the sand. All the sand that's in the world, try and count it. God's thoughts for you are far exceed that. Friends, is this not love? This is amazing love. And friends, do you know that you, the fellowship that God wants with you is a fellowship that he can have with no one else? Now you're saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. Didn't you say only the human race? Yes, the human race. But the fellowship that he's seeking with you is a fellowship that he can enter into with no other. It's unique from every other. Someone says, how do you know? Friends, listen. Revelation 2 says that God, Jesus says, that I'm going to give you a white stone and a new name which no one else knows but me and you. Now, people read it. They say, I shared this in the week. What in the world? A name that no one knows, then what good is the name? But friends, we all know that in the close circle of family, that normally brother would give sister a unique name that only the family knows. There's only a husband gives wife a unique name that is only between them two. When Jesus speaks about giving to each of the redeemed a new name, meaning there's going to be such an intimacy, a relationship, a fellowship between Jesus and that soul as unique to Jesus, completely unique, which he has with none other of the redeemed except with you. This is the fellowship he's calling us to. This is what God wants, friends. Fellowship. But let me say this. There are things that hinder fellowship. You know what's the things the prophet says hinders fellowship? One of the main things that hinders fellowship? Pride. Selfishness. Pride and selfishness, she says, hinders fellowship. We can never into when it's all about me. Pride. I can't do that. No, no, no. I want this. Pride and selfishness hinders fellowship. I want to conclude. 
She says, I'm coming to some powerful things. She says, whilst pride, variance, and strife for supremacy are cherished, the heart cannot enter into fellowship with Christ. Pride stops fellowship. And friends, we talk about there can also be pride in God's work. Can stop fellowship as well. Pride in his work. Now, another thing that stops fellowship is the issue of, let me not tell you, let's read it. You tell me what will cause you to enter into fellowship, nearness with Christ. I'm going to read it and you tell me. Tell me, what brings you into nearness with Christ? She says, This was the purpose of God in giving us a part to act in the plan of redemption. He has granted men the privilege of becoming partakers of the divine nature. Next sentence, this is the highest honor and the greatest joy that is possible for God to bestow upon man. Obviously, we're working with Jesus. Now listen to this in the plan of redemption. Those who thus become participants in labors of love are brought nearest to their creator. What is she talking about? What is she talking about? That if you participate in this labor, that you're brought nearest to the creator, to Christ. Talking about evangelism. Friends, if you want to enter into a, a union with Christ, a fellowship with him, engage in the work. And as we said many a times, there's not only one way to work for God, there's many ways to work for God. Many, many, many ways to work for God. So one thing, if you're going to enter into fellowship, engage in the work. Whatever work God calls you to, engage in it. Now, there's more things that hinder this. this the, oh, I want to conclude on this one. This last point here, and then I want to just read this, these beautiful quotations. But I want to conclude on this last point. Now, friends, do you know that God's inviting me to a fellowship which What's different from this? The prophet says that angels, even in eternity rolls, that angels are going to stop and they're going to listen. They don't know about this, but mankind knows about it. It's a fellowship that God's inviting us into. But it's the, a fellowship, someone says, God invited me into this. It's a fellowship of suffering. Someone says, What? a fellowship of pain. This is what God's inviting me into, is a fellowship of suffering and pain, friends. Say, what in the world, God, you want me to have fellowship with you in suffering and pain? Friend, let me ask you something. When a mother loves a child, and they see their child on the deathbed, lying there, almost dead, taken with fever, whatever the case may be, question, even though the the child's suffering, question, Does the mother suffer? What causes her to suffer? Sometimes her her suffering might even be worse than the child. It's the love. She shares in the sufferings of the child, even though she's not getting any physical pain. But because of the love for the child, she enters into the fellowship of suffering with the child. And I'm saying, that God wants me to share the suffering, wants me to enter into a fellowship of suffering. Now, let me say this. There are two men that left this planet that stand highest in the books of heaven simply because they entered into fellowship of suffering, fellowship of pain. Someone says, who are those two men? Two men. Someone says Moses, Enoch. Enoch was translated. Moses there. Actually, the prophet says Enoch. Mm-mm. Moses. Mm-mm. She actually did a quotation. She says, Mm-mm. not these two men. She specifically mentions, friends, aren't you, before I even go there. Now, I want you to see this. Where's my quotation? She says that the highest privilege, the highest Listen to this, highest honor, desire of ages 2 to 8, 2 to 4, I mean. She says, of all gifts that heaven can bestow upon man, all gifts that heaven can bestow, fellowship, that's the word we've been studying, we are studying fellowship, the mystery. She says, fellowship with Christ, in what? Friends, Christ is inviting you to come and suffer with him. 
That's the door he has opened up as a door of suffering. He says, come and share my suffering. Friends, when we share his suffering, we'll view things different. The way we view sin now, we'll view it completely different when we enter into sufferings, fellowship with Christ. She says, of all gifts that heaven can bestow upon man, fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. Please tell me what is this? He is the most weighty trust and the highest honor. What we are studying here, fellowship of suffering, pain, we are talking about the highest honor. This is the highest, the weightiest trust and the highest honor heaven can bestow upon us as fellowship, suffering. Not my words, the prophet's words. Now, please tell me who are the two men that entered into this and they stand highest because they entered into this. <laughs> On the record of those who through self abnegation now friends, please get this, this is sweet. On the record of those who through self abnegation have entered into fellowship of Christ the sufferings, stand one in the old and one in the new. The names of Jonathan and John the Baptist. Now I'm not going through their lives, what caused them, but Jonathan was next to the throne. Next to the throne, God sets him aside and says, David, you next. You know what Jonathan done? Yeah, oh thank you. There was no, oh, God loves me less, he loves David more than me. Nothing of that. You, may, you know, let me say this, even amongst us, if you can, if somebody would have, okay, God has set you aside, he has chosen someone else to do the work that you are doing, which was assigned you, God literally through it, some vision or some, he says, I've set you aside. Do you know that many people will become disheartened and murmur and complain, and they might even leave the work and say, what, well, nothing to do with God. He put someone above me. Yeah, Jonathan, even though God set him aside, he humbly submits and he says, I'm gonna help accomplish the, what God said. Friends, he entered into this fellowship of the sufferings. This is the height of self abnegation Self is put completely aside. Not even a breath of self. Not even a breath. Now watch this. Watch this. I'm, I'm co co coming to this. Watch this. Watch this. Where's my quotation? Hmm. Hmm. Mm. Watch this. Where is it? Education. It was in education. Where? Okay, there's it. Education. She says, the redeemed only of all created beings have in their own experience known the actual conflict with sin. They have wrought with Christ. Now watch this. We are talking about fellowship of suffering. And even, and as even the angels could not do, even the angels could not do, have entered into the fellowship of his sufferings. Angels know nothing about what we are talking about. No, no, not to say they don't not. They cannot enter into this. Only people that can do it is the human family. Only the human family. God wants, is inviting us, friends. This is the highest, the weightiest trust. Fellowship. Now, friends, let me, let me conclude with this Bible verse and then we conclude with um, this, this PowerPoint, this current events. Come on in your Bible. Someone says, how do I enter into fellowship? What, what is it talking about? Come with me to Zechariah 12. I want to conclude here. Zechariah 12. Zechariah chapter 12. Can I ask you a question? Is God in pain today? Yes. Education 263. She says, those who think of hindering or hastening the gospel, Think of it in relation to themselves or to the world. Few think of it in relation to God. Few give thought to the suffering sin has caused our Creator. All heaven suffering crisis agony, but that agony did not begin nor end in his manifestation in humanity. The cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain, which, the what word? Pain, which from its very inception, sin has brought to the heart of God. What has sin brought to the heart of God? Pain from its very inception. Now, friends, I want you to see what will cause me to feel the same pain God feels in some degree towards sin. 
I want you to see what is it that will cause me to view sin and feel the way God feels towards sin. I want you to see Zechariah 12, because in that quotation, she says the cross is a revelation of the pain. So if you want to look at how God feels, look at the cross. But I want you to see Zechariah 12, verse 10. It says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirits of grace and of supplication. Watch it. They will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn. What is mourn? Do people mourn, bitterly mourn because they're happy? What do they mourn for? We're in pain. They shall mourn for him as one mourned for his only son and shall be in bitterness, not joy. They shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Friends, it's very clear that the only way I can truly feel the way God feels towards sin, I need my eyes riveted upon Jesus. I must see him bleeding on Calvary. And as I see that, as I see that, I will realize that sin costs too much. It is too expensive. It costs the blood of the Son of God. Now, I conclude. I conclude here. Oh, 139, it was 17 and 18. 17 and 18. I conclude here. I conclude. Listen to this. Friends, this quotation is almost beyond belief. Almost beyond belief. Testimonies to Ministers 518. If there's a quotation that is almost beyond belief, there's one, but it's true. I'm only going straight to the red words. It would not satisfy. It would not satisfy the heart of the infinite one to give to those who love his son a lesser blessing than he gives his son. Almost beyond belief that when you enter into this fellowship and you approach him, he can give and will not satisfy his heart to give you anything less than he would give his son had his son been speaking an oxen. Almost beyond belief. Friends, one more sweet quotation and I'll stop. Listen to this. But they would accept their lot with a cheerful spirit, remembering that for all that the world neglects to bestow, God himself will make up to them in the best of favors. Amen. Does that not love? That whatever the world fails, whatever supposed to be, God makes up with the best of favors. Do you know if a general sends a lieutenant and a message don't get there because the lieutenant is unfaithful, do you know what the general will do? He will send another lieutenant and another lieutenant until that message gets through. No matter who fails to do what God has assigned them to do, God will just sign somebody else to make sure you get that message. Friends, I'm telling you, is this not love? When I saw this this week, I was bought. I said, Lord, fellowship I want. Fellowship. That's why this, when we were fasting and praying, I was just speaking about fellowship, friendship. I conclude. Friends, a storm's coming. I wish we could study, but time's up. Storm's coming. Global food prices likely to soar. Global food prices likely to soar. Will the price of food increase? Prophet says that in Maranatha. What is the solution? Get out of the city into the country. Country living, page nine. Grow your own food. Why? Time's coming. We cannot buy or sell. Let's see what the World Economic Forum wants you to eat. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. But we are in the midst of the fourth industrial revolution, which accelerates global change. Global energy systems, food systems, and supply chains will be deeply affected. It means investing into a greener and therefore more sustainable economy. Climate change can lead 
to an extinction of large parts of our global population. How about you eating the bugs? <laughs> insects may be on our menu. Bugs for dinner? Eating insects. In a couple of years, business could well be hopping. Do the people in charge really want us to eat bugs? <laughs> Ancient elites were Conspiracy involved. people, they invent anything you can think of, but uh, no, it, it, it's complete nonsense. Uh, the company is called Insect. This is the insect protein just been approved by the EU. Klaus Schwab said, we have infiltrated the governments of the Netherlands. And I'm just really- He's quite open about it. He's open about it. So yeah. no conspiracy theory whatsoever. Nobody forces people to eat uh, insects. For the food of the food of the Nicole Kidman, and I am going to eat a four-course meal of bugs. Can you see great famous people? We're eating bugs, it's the new thing. New thing. Drive them into the city and then when the prices of food so give them bugs to eat. Give them bugs to eat. Excellent. Now, Definitely, sister. Pope Francis, the visions, there's the man of sin. I clo close it. The visions attacks are always the work of the devil. So he says there should be unity and not division. Now, what is he talking about? April 21st, 2023. Vatican praises atheistic Buddhist. Compassion as an antidote to the global crisis. So the Pope talks about union. What union does he want? A union of all false religions. That's what he's looking for. Did the prophet say they will unite under one head, volume 7, 140, 140, what is it, 142, 182, 182. She says under one head, the world will unite to oppose God under the papal head. All false religions will unite. Again, Pope Francis says the climate crisis de demands, not, not suggests, demands the creation of a new far-sighted economic model. So what he is saying is that we need a new e e e e um, economic model, a new system of living. Talking about economy, that's the digital system based upon climate change. Again, the social and environmental crisis are one. Pope tells interfaith leaders. So what it says here that the social and the environmental crisis are one. So that means whatever solution you give to the environmental crisis is the same solution you give for the social crisis. They have the same solution because it's the same crisis. What is the, what is the solution? What does he say to you? Sunday, 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 Sunday. Friends, we are almost home. God is inviting us into fellowship, into fellowship. Do you want to enter into fellowship? Let us pray, let us pray. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for yeah, this great invite. Thank you for, so much, Father, for revealing to us the very burden of your heart. That which is, we are told in Ephesians was the eternal purpose, even creating man, that you might enter into fellowship. And Father, we know that the final generation, even this generation, like Enoch, are going to enter into this fellowship. And Lord, we want to be a part of that. Pride, selfishness must be laid aside. Please, Lord, may these things be uprooted out of our hearts. Please, Lord. Thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you so much for Calvary, which stands as a memorial of your love, a revelation, not so much, yes, indeed, we can see, Father, you love the world. But we see in Galatians 2.20, you loved me. You loved us as individuals. And we are truly thankful. These are precious thoughts, Lord, that never are we absent from your mind. 
We love you and we are just pleading, Lord, that as we have studied this great yearning of your heart, that by your grace going forward, like Enoch, we would walk with you. And we are told in inspiration that Enoch's walking with you, that we should pray in the closet as we go about our daily labors. Let our hearts be often uplifted to God. It is thus that Enoch walked with God. Help us, Lord. May you truly become our best of friends, closest of friends. May nothing come between our souls and the Savior. We love you. Bless us. Bless the service as we continue throughout the day. And please, Father, we just pray for a deeper experience with you. We love you. We just pray may our love for you continually grow. For we ask these things humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Someday the silver cord will break And I no more as now shall sing But all the joy when I shall wake Within the palace of the king And I shall see him face to